only grand, Spanish or Russian or something. What are you doing? Good morning, good morning. Oh, Mr. Kenman. Oh, Hazel, you know, from the paper shop. The one who hates Lloyd George and wags his head very slowly all the time. He says, Lloyd George is no good. Oh, do Mr. Kenman, Hazel, go on. I couldn't. I've only seen him about twice. I never go to the paper shop.
okay, whatever she had arranged. You'd insist on doing your Spanish turn. And why not? Well, it doesn't come into the sea, but I've gone for that. Oh, you were easily arranging that deal. Uh, I've just been telling Dr. Hallam in his how clever you are. Is he surprised? Because Matthew Watt, if it's the first time I've seen Monica Halliday out of a land girl costume, I'm surprised she didn't turn up here tonight in her trousers and leggings. She looks quite queer out here, doesn't she? Almost as if she were a female impersonator. Oh, come on, Kay, okay. what are we to do? The first thing, puss, is an old lady who can't find her cat. But she's really a sort of witch. I'm to be the old lady. Yes, and mother, you and Kay have her two daughters who are visiting her. Yes, dear. Well, I know my witch. I keep saying, I always hated that terrible cat of yours, mother. But that's all oh, can I work? That's all right, dear. I shall be the Spanish daughter, you see. <laughs> And then I think I'd better not appear in the other, because I expect you'll want to be free to play after Well, of course, but I have put you down for two more. I suppose Madge and Joan Helfrid will have to do those. What a pity, Robin. You know, Madge, he wrote and said he might have demobbed any day now. And it's in such a shame <laughs> just to miss Kate's party. Robin loves parties. He's like me. Your father never cared for them much. Suddenly, right in the middle, just when everything was getting going, he wanted to be quiet. And he'd take me into the corner and ask me how much longer people were staying, just when they were beginning to enjoy themselves. I never could understand that. Oh, I can. I've often felt like that. Oh, dear. What happened? It isn't sensible if you're having a party. You're having a party. It isn't that, Mother. And it isn't that you suddenly dislike people. It's just that you feel, or at least I do, and I suppose Barbara did too, that it isn't real. And you want something to be. Real, do you see, Mother? No, dear, I don't. It sounds a little morbid to me. But then your father could be morbid at times. You may not think so, but he could. And I suppose you take after him. Mother, he thinks sometimes in a rather mysterious sort of way. He is. You will be. Oh, look at Hazel. Doesn't she look rather strange? I remember when I first wore those things. <laughs> Knew what, dear? Knew what was going to happen to him. Alan says that some of the men he knew who were killed in the trenches, well, they seemed to know that they were going to be killed. Almost as if a shadow fell over them. Just as if now and then we can see round the corner into the future. You do have the most extraordinary ideas. You must try and put some of them into your book. <laughs> Are you happy, darling? Oh, yes, Mother, very happy. Oh, that's all right, then. I want you to have a lovely birthday. I think we can all be happy again. Now that horrible war was all over, and people are sensible again. And Robin and Alan, great things. Oh, I forgot to ask. Did Robin send you anything, Kay? No, I didn't expect him to, Mother. But well, that's not like Robin, Kay. He's most generous for him. Much too generous, really. And I may be, he thinks he's coming home very soon. <laughs> oh, Alan, tell what we're starting, and it's three syllables. I think you all look marvellous. <laughs> I'm not with this, you know, Kate. Don't try to warn you. Now, Carol, you start. Remember, only say cost once. Don't you two say it, only Carol. Now, where can I do that? Good old Carol. Come on, you two. <laughs> <laughs> right, now, the next symbol is X, Y. So I thought you would be cheating too bad if we called that sign. You know, copy. I spy bird. So the next scene's an East End scene. Madge, you're to be the old mother. Yes, I remember. What am I? I forget. Your bird. Just put something silly on. Look, Joan, is there anything here that you can wear? I was in London last week, staying with my uncle, and we went to that theatre three times. We saw Tilly Bloomsbury and Cinderella Man and Kissing Time. I like Cinderella Man best. Oh, and there, oh, you know. I thought Robin was coming home soon. He is. He's an officer, isn't he? You weren't stuck, so were you, Alan? Well, no, I was just the last corporal. One strike, you know, nothing at all. Did you want to be anything better than that? Oh, no. Alan has absolutely no ambition at all, hope for my pet. Not much. <laughs> if I were a man, I'd want to be something very important. What do you do now, Alan? Somebody said you're at the town hall. I am, in the rent office. Oh, just the clerk, you know. Is it dull? Oh, yes. Oh, never mind being dull. I believe he has tremendous love adventures inside his head that nobody knows anything about. Hazel says you've started another note of pay, have you? Yes. I don't know how you can. Well, I mean, I think I'd be all right once I'd started properly, but I just don't see how to start. What did you do with the last one? Burnt it. Why? It's a future. Well, but wasn't that normal waste of time? Yes, I suppose it was. Still, though, it's the time. 
time you and I went to go. Oh no, I'm always doing something. Well, even though I happen to go to the canteen anymore, I'm always busy. <laughs> Why do you laugh, Matt? Can't you tell enough? You always did laugh at me, Matt. So it's because I'm not clever like you.
people's behaviour differently, when there's still war restrictions on everything, they can't have it both ways. Yeah, well, there's still a lot of profiteering. Business has to find its own level. The more interference, the worse it is. The worse for everyone? Yeah. I doubt it. You work in the town hall, don't you? Not <coughs> about these things working there, you know. I say, I bet you two were very good in the Shirad, weren't you? No, we weren't very amusing. Oh, they were awful. Oh, no, you weren't too bad, Mr. Leavers. Especially for a man playing Shirad in a strange house. Oh, I'll call that handsome, Miss Carroll. <laughs> Come on, Mac, the whole word. Puzzle word. We won't bother dressing up for this one. Just some good acting. Now, I'll say the word. Jim, you go tell Matt she's in this one. Just the girls for the grand finale. So we're sacked. Yes, no good. Then we can give ourselves a drink. We've earned a drink. Any dancing afterwards? Well, I'm sure there will be after some other play. You dance, Peter? No, I never at the time. Yes, we must have some dancing, Gerald. You coming out? But she's looking for a much better school. Good old man. 
And I think I'll pick up the tab for my clothes, mother. I mean, you can't get anything really decent in you, Ringham. I'm going to start selling down. I've got to look like a man who knows a decent soup when he sees one. Oh, gosh. It's great to be back. Not just some filthy little leave, either. Okay, mother, steady. There's nothing to cry about now. I know, dear. You're looking very artful, Mother. And I, I'm not feeling very well. Joan's girl has to be a very nice little girl, hasn't she? Quite. And I think she's got a pleasant, easy disposition. Not very clever or go ahead or anything like that. But a thoroughly nice girl. Yes, I bet she is.
the only thing about this business that didn't make me hate the fourth vision, the chance that you might be able to come. Mother says you're not to tell you that. No, I've got to get back to London tonight. Work? Yes. I could have been in Southampton in the morning. Write a nice little piece about the newest little film star. Do you often have to do that? Yes, Alan. Quite often. There are an awful lot of film stars and they're always arriving in Plymouth. Let's go right at Southampton down there, right? And all the women readers of the Daily Courier want to read a nice bright half column about their glamorous favourites. Yes, they look very nice, but um, all rather alike. They are all rather alike. And so are my writing to them. In fact, sometimes I feel like all those round and round like poor old surface moments. Are you writing another novel? No, my dear, I'm not. <laughs> I tell myself that too many people are writing. Yes, it does look like that sometimes. Yes, but that's not a real reason. Oh, I still feel that mine wouldn't be like theirs. At least the next one wouldn't, even if the last one was it. Well, just at the moment I, I couldn't. The last time you were okay, I mean, to me you seemed rather unhappy, I thought. I was not unhappy. That's why I remembered you and Rose. Not very flattering to you, is it? In a way it is, you know. Oh, yes, Kay, I'd take that as a compliment. Oh, Alan. I love that coat you're wearing. It doesn't seem to go with the rest of you somehow. No. Well, you see, I, I, I just wear it in the house. It's an old coat. As a house coat, it saves my other one. I often talk of you on tonight. I'll, I'll change it before the others come. Just have it, should I? Why are you so unhappy then? I mean, the last time you went. Something that was always ending really did come to an end. It had been going on for ten years, off and on. Eating up more of my life when he was off than when he was on. He was married. There were children. Oh, it was the usual nasty mother. Alan, you don't know what day it is today, do you? I do. I do. And of course, mother did too. Look. Ah, you angel! You know, I never thought I'd get another single birthday present. You know how old I am? Forty. I'm forty-four. And it's all right, you know. You'll like it. Have a look at your present, I, I hope it's all right. Hello, Alan. Hello, Joe. I suppose 
with her. She's been doing some ballet dancing, you know. And the teacher thinks she's marvellous for her age. We forgot her last birthday cake. The child was so disappointed. I'm sorry. Tell her I'll make it up to her at Christmas. That's been well of job or something. I read your article on Glenn Fox. You know, about three months ago when she came over from Hollywood. Did she really say all those things to you, Kate? Or did you make them up? She said some of them. I made the rest up. Did she say anything about Leo Frobisher? Her husband, you know, and they get separate. Yes, but I didn't print it. Oh, what did she say? She said, I'll bet that God got left over ham husband of mine gets himself bored out of the next boat. He's a sweet child, baby, like him. She sounds awful, but I suppose you can't judge by the way they talk, using all that slang. And I never do think you're very lucky, kid. I dare. Sometimes, when I manage to remember what women go through, all women, all over the world, I don't think I know about it. You know, most of the time I feel clean out of that. I know that's what I say. But I think you're very lucky. Meeting all these people and being in London and all that. Look at me, still in Newlyham, and I know Newlyham. And it gets worse and worse. Tell me that. Oh, I don't suppose you notice. Know. I think it's about the same. Perhaps we get worse, that's all. And you are really, aren't you? I mean, you never seem to bother about everything as most people do. I often wonder whether you're happy inside or just dull. But I often wonder about people like that, don't you? So I suppose being so clever now and a writer and everything, you know about people. But I don't. Um, I simply can't tell just from looking at them. We had a maid, you know, Jessie. And she seemed such a cheerful little thing, always smiling and humming. Ernest used to get quite cross with her. She was too cheerful, really. And then suddenly, she took over 20 aspirin all at once. We had to have the doctor and everything. And she said it was simply because she couldn't bear it any longer. She'd had enough of everything, she said. Isn't it strange? Yes, but you must feel like that sometimes too, don't you? Yes, I do. But I'm always surprised when other people do, because somehow they never look. Robin rang me up yesterday. Uh, he's living in Leicester now. And I told him about tonight, and he said he might look in because he wouldn't be far away. I hope he doesn't. What's he doing now, Hazel? I don't know, really. He's always changing, but it's something to do with commission. Have you come there, Joe? Shall I tell Joe he must come with you? No. Rest it. Well, my Hazel, haven't you brought Alex with you? Uh, no, Mother. I, I hope he'll be here soon. Of course he will. We can't do anything until Gerald arrives. He knows how things are exactly. Where's Max? I thought she went upstairs. Oh, she's probably taking something to our room. I've never known anybody take them and things before that. She's given herself so many notions, garbles, and plays that no man has ever twice like her or faith. How's that, Anna? I think we ought to have both porch and whiskey in here, don't you? I told the girls to get it ready in the dining room. Better bring it in. Now, what I wonder is this. Should we all sit round looking very stiff and bored, like a proper business affair, or should we make it comfortable and cozy? What do you think? I think, Mother, you're rather enjoying this. Well, after all, why should I? It's nice to have all my children back home again. You imagine. I said it's nice to have all my children back home again. Even you, Matt. I'm not a child, and this is no longer my home. You were a child once, and I don't talk about you. Now, for 20 years, this was your home. So please don't talk to me in that tone. We're not in the classroom now, remember. No, Mother, please. It's not going to be easy. Don't worry, Hazel. Mother enjoys things not to be easy. Oh, it's the man of Phyllis from Stormy Dining to here to see. What's the name of the restaurant? The Ivy, Mother, and the man is a man called Hugo Steele. I've told you already. Yes, my dear, but you didn't tell me much. But Phyllis, from there, you seem awfully friendly together. I suppose he's an old friend. Yes. It would be a good. If you could, I mean, if he's a.
really nice man. Yes, Mother, a great pity. I've always hoped you'd settle down to some nice man. And when the Philipsons told Mother, me... I'm 40 today. Had you forgotten? Of course not, my dear. A mother always remembers. Joe? Yes, Granny, go away. Oh, don't call me that ridiculous name. I forgot to answer the sir. Didn't I tell you it was Kate Bradley? I have something for you, too. Oh, no, Mother, don't be silly. I... Your father bought me this the second Christmas after we married with a sharp brooch. Brazilian diamonds. It was an old piece then. Look at the colours of the stones. You always get that with the old South American diamonds. There. It's very sweet, you, Mother. But I'd really rather not take that from you. Don't you observe. It's mine. And I can wish you to. Come along, take it, or I'll be cross. And many happy returns, of course. <clears throat> when we were young, I never liked you as much as I would hate Now I think that's wrong. Mother. Oh, I know, my dear. But you're such a fool with that little husband of yours. Now, if he won't, he isn't. And you really know very little about him. Oh, I'm sure many black people. I hate to see other women sitting around with no men. They always look silly. And I feel silly myself, and I don't know why. <coughs> well, of course, you're here, and I'm forgetting you. Or forgetting you were a man. I must grow a shaggy beard and bang on my chest and rule. <laughs> when they're Uncle Frank, that's really how they live in London. Took the children to the zoo for the first time. Think of it to the same time. We saw this enormous monkey. What Alan just said then reminded me. Would anybody? That the glass walked. Okay. Hey, look. How about you, mad? Spoiling wise. Remember what Meredith said about us in the egoist. Nobody reads Meredith anymore and nobody takes. I used to read Meredith when I was young. I thought I was very clever. But I didn't quite caught then. Now, I don't care about Meredith. Not a good for this. Even I know that. Although men say for me to know anything about it, but it's rich and warm and even this. I have handsome compliments. That's gone now. Nobody pays compliments anymore. Except for old Dr. Hallett, who's over 80 and has no memory at all. <laughs> he was talking to me about half an hour the other day, thinking I was Mrs. Rush for it. <laughs> ah! That's probably Gerald. At last. Yes, Madge. But you mustn't be so impatient. Hello, Gerald. Hello, Alan. Oh, would you like a drink, Gerald, before you begin talking? No, thank you. Hello, Gerald. How are you, Kay? I'm quite well, thank you. Sorry, Gerald, but it's true. What is? I always remember you saying that you didn't mind living in Newlyham but that you were determined to be as different as possible from the newly and type of man. I don't remember saying that. You did. And now, I'm sorry, but it's true. You look just like all the newly and types of men grown into one. What do I do? What a job. Oh, good evening, Ernest. Good evening. Oh, Ernest, I'm so glad you're here. You are, eh? Because that means you won't stay now, just a sign. You know about this time. Please be nice to me tonight, especially Mother. It would be such help if you wanted to speak. I'll uh, we'll get this off. Uh, I shouldn't say a word if I were you, Hazel. I mean to me. You'd only make things worse. Now then, everybody, please be quiet and pay attention. Now then, Hazel, stop pitching there and sit down. We must be very business like cousin for Gerald. I'm so glad you were able to come, Dennis. Your help is to be business like, won't you? Yes. And that doesn't mean you're at liberty to make yourself unpleasant. Be quiet, Madge. Now then, everybody, Gerald, tell us all about it. Acting under instructions of Mrs. Conway, after we decided you should all meet here, I have prepared a short statement of Mrs. Conway's present financial position. Gerald? 
Yes? Must you talk in this awful, dry, inhuman way? After all, I've known you since you were four. And the children have known you all their lives. And you're talking as if you've never known any of us before. It sounds so horrid. But I'm not here now as a friend of the family, but as your solicitor. No. You're here as a friend of the family who happens to be my solicitor. I think it would be much better if you told us all in a simple, friendly way what the position is. I think that would be better, you know, Gerald. So do I. When you talk in that dry little manner, I can't take you seriously. It's not much as if you read one of our own charades. What a big fun. And you're so good, little Gerald. Why can't we have some more? What a chore. I don't see why not. Your mother was older than we are now, and she used to play. You're not proposing to turn this into a charade, are you, Hayden? What a pity it isn't. Perhaps it is. How do you start being silly, Alan? Now then, Gerald, tell us how things are. For another, don't read out of six and eight and that sort of thing. Keep them for anybody who wants to see them. Perhaps you'd like to have a look at them later, eh? Huh? Come on. Well, go on. Well, the position is this. A Mrs. Conway, for a long time now, has derived her income from two sources. A holding in Farrow and Conway Limited, and some property in Newry. The houses at the North End of Church Road. Well, Farrow and Conway were hit badly by the slum and had not recovered it. The houses in Church Road were not worth anything like what they were. And the only chance of making that property pay was to convert those houses into flats. But that would demand a substantial outlay of capital. Now, Mrs. Conway has received an offer for a holding in Farrow and Conway. But that would no, would not pay for reconstruction of the flats. Meanwhile, that property may soon become a liability instead of an asset. So you see, the situation is very serious. I must say, I'm very surprised. I always understood that nothing was left extremely well for my before. Certainly, I was. Your father thought of that. Both the shares and the property have declined in value. Yes, but even so, I'm still surprised. Mother must have been very extravagant. Mrs. Conway hasn't been as careful as she might have been. There were six of you to bring up an education. It isn't that. I know how much we've cost. It's since then that the money's been spent. And I know who must have had most of it. That was wrong. It. it was my money. It was not. It was only yours to hold in trust for us. Alan, you're the eldest. You've been here all this time. Why didn't you do something? I'm afraid I haven't bothered much about these things. Well, then you ought to have done. I think it's absolutely wicked. I've worked hard earning my living for over 20 years. And I look forward to having a little of what father left. Enough to pay for a few really good holidays or buy a house of my own. And now, it's all gone, just because Mother and Robin between them have flung it away. You ought to be ashamed of yourself talking like this. What if I have helped Robin? He needs it, and I'm his mother. If you needed it, I'd help you too. You wouldn't. When I told you I had a chance to buy a partnership in that school, you laughed at me. Because you were all right where you were, you didn't need to buy any partnerships. Oh, and Robin did, I suppose. Yes. Because he's a man with a wife and children to support. Mm. Oh, this is typical of you. Call yourself a socialist and blame people for taking an interest in money. And when it comes down to it, you're most maximum of all. I don't call myself a socialist, so that's got nothing to do with it. How long does this go on? I've got something else to do. It's all right, and. Oh, look what you've done, that you'll make Joe cry. Sorry. I've just remembered so many things that. At the present moment in time, Mrs. Conway has a considerable overdraft in the bank. Now, there are two possible causes of action. One is to sell the houses or they'll fetch and the whole of the shares. But I warn you, the houses won't fetch much. The alternative is well, to sell the share and to raise an, an additional sum, maybe between two or three thousand pounds. Then convert the houses into flats. But we've had to receive from the architect. All sounds most attractive. Then we like 30 nice flats. And you know what people will pay for flats and stairs. Don't you think it's a splendid idea, Ernest? Well, I thought if we discussed everything in a nice, friendly way, we could decide something. Oh, I know you businessmen like everything cut and dry, but I think it's much nicer to be nice and friendly. Don't think it's true that people only do things 
And I thought, if I'd sold it, I'd have raised enough money to convert the church drone houses into flats. Oh, you couldn't. Nothing left. Really, Ernest. I was off five thousand pounds for it once. Uh, and you should have taken it. I'm afraid you can't count very much for this house. Though, of course, I'll save money by living in a smaller place. Not much, though. I have to pay rent in a smaller place. This is mother's. But rates and taxes are very heavy on this house. I want you all to understand the present situation is very unsatisfactory. The overdraft will be paid off simply, of course, by selling the share of some of the houses. But after that, Mrs. Conway will be worse off than ever. Now, as the money from the, for the conversion will be raised, and that property will bring in a steady income. Is that the reason? Right. I might tell you one more time. A nice, cozy little flat. After you've sold your shares, you still have to find two or three thousand. Pay for conversion to flats. I couldn't I borrow that? Not from the bank. They won't accept the Church Road property as security for a loan to convert them into flats. I've tried that. Uh, Ernest could lend you the money. What? He could easily afford it, Ernest. From what I hear, you're very well off indeed now, Ernest. Oh, there's no doubt about that. And it only seemed blessed as Ernest first came here. A very shy young man from nowhere. Twenty years ago. That's what I was. A shy young man from nowhere. And when I managed to wangle myself into this house, I thought I'd got somewhere. Yes, I remember feeling that way about you at the time, Ernest. Uh, and you all made me feel like I'd got somewhere to. But I've stuck it. I've always been able to stick it on my mind on something I really want. That's how I managed to get on. No, oh, don't begin to tell us now. How you landed it with only a shilling in your pocket. No, that not be. Don't worry. You're not going to hear the story of my life. Well, I may as well tell you. As far as I'm concerned, you can whistle for your two or three thousand pounds. You don't get a penny out of me. And while I'm making myself really nice present, I may as well tell you, I can give you that two or three thousand without even feeling it. I'm not for it. Not a penny. You make me feel ashamed. Oh, why? Oh, tell me why I made you feel ashamed. Tell me. Or would you rather tell me later when I'm telling you a few things? I never did like you, Venus. You know, I'm up on my toe. Put you out of this house now! You did not take action for assault. And I enjoy it. <laughs> my money on the boot, eh? I told Hazel a long time ago that none of you would ever see a penny I made. And what, me? Ask her. I swore the very first night I came. When you were all so high and mighty, especially you. But none of you would ever see a penny of my money. I see. What's that supposed to be? What she has. She's been giving you money. Mama! Look at Robin, you should. What does it matter? He can't eat you. Don't go if you don't want to. Oh, Hazel, there's nothing to be afraid of. There is. I'm frightened of you. Except right to the first, I've always been frightened. What? That a pit street, what can he do? I'm afraid it was, you know. 
see Mother and Hazel who will have to pay for it. Well, she needn't. Johnny has to let me know what he's up to. If we could have told him like that, what could you do? You could make her life a misery and you couldn't stop it. It's her own fault. I've no patience with her. I wouldn't stand it ten minutes. No use you talking about. You think we're going to have to judge you never even be married. No, from what I've seen here, I think I'm very lucky. You're not lucky. Never were I ever. And I don't have the least idea of what a woman's real life is like in the less you say the better. You're not a, a lot of schoolgirls and silly teachers. Robin, give me a glass of port. I thought you'd like to do too, I don't think there's any point in my staying any longer. But we haven't settled anything. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the charge of Ellis Beavers might have persuaded to lend that money. And I don't think anybody else here has £3,000. All right, Thorne, there's no need to be so damn supercilious about it. It seems to me you haven't made a particularly bright job of handling my mother's affairs. I don't think that comes too well from you. For years I've given good advice and never once have it been acted upon. Now, I don't think you should be likely to hand over these affairs. I believe I could make a better job of it myself. I couldn't imagine a possibly worse choice. Good night, Mr. Conway. Nice pay. Good night, Alice. I think I'll come along too, Gerald. Oh, you've never got a nice little chat around me on the way. It doesn't hurt so much that you speak, Robin, when you talk so bitterly. I suppose one day it won't hurt at all. Sorry, old girl. Uh, give my love to the kids. Tell them I'm coming to see them soon. Yes, come and see them. But remember, we're very poor. Right? Thanks for that. And then you talk about being bitter. Good night, my dear. Good night, dear. Good night. Seeing you again. Well, now we might be able to settle something. So far as I'm concerned, this, this has just been a complete waste of time and nervous energy. Well, I think that Gerald Thorne has is now a dreary, conceited, middle-aged bachelor. I'm afraid of pity you didn't marry him. What? Marriage? <laughs> I don't think she fancied Gerald Thornton. Oh, she did once, didn't you, dear? And I really think it was interesting. But that was a very long time ago when your children were all still at home. But if that's not true, then it's stupid, silly talk. If it is true, it's cruel nonsense. I'm not the high and mighty cliche. It was true. A long time ago. After the war. A time when I still thought we could suddenly make everything better for everyone. Socialism, peace, universal brotherhood, all that. And I felt then that Gerald Thornton and I together could help. He had a lot of fine quality about him. Maybe we had them. And only needed to be pulled out of his rough here to have the enthusiasm aroused. I was remembering it tonight. And I was looking at him. That was quite a good thing. One evening. Just one evening. And something you did that evening ruined it all. I'd almost forgot. Seeing us all here tonight reminded me. I, I think it was a sort of party for you, Ken. Do you remember? Very nice day, sir. I had a bunch of nonsense when we're all being foolish. Yes. You remember. It was quite deliberate on your part. Just to keep a useful young man on a
that you wanted it, turn on me all my fault. You'll never really think about me. Don't see things for a moment from my point of view. When you were children, I was so proud of you. So confident that you would grow up to be wonderful. I used to see myself the age I am now, surrounded by you and your own children, so proud of you. So happy with you all. This house happier and gayer even than it was in the best of the old days. But now, my life has gone far. I thought it up. You all are a simple, sour, school business. Middle age before your time. Listen, the loveliest girl I ever was. Married to a Vulgar little bully and terrified of him. Maybe, on the way to their own life, he's very bitter and secretive about it. And if she failed, how oh, the happiest and kindest of you all dead to watch this twenty. Robin, oh, I know, my dear, I'm not blaming you, Robin, I must speak the truth for us. With a wife, I know sort of position or comfort or anything. I'll be helpless. The boy his father and daughter, he's not fighting anything what is he now. A miserable clerk with no ambitions, no self-respect, a shabby little man that nobody would look at twice. Yes, a shabby little clerk that nobody would look at twice. <laughs> It's not a bad description, is it, Mother? I am a shabby little clerk. Must be very disappointing. Don't be so forgiving. Mother, you've always been a selfish and a bit of good for a Stay the other one, girl. I've had a lot of bad luck, too, you know. And a lot of it's just luck. I don't see that. Oh. As a bad luck to my But the point is, whatever they may be, Robin, my dear, you're my own boy and my own sort, and great comfort. So you and I will go up again and talk. That's a spirit. Mother, we both said what we wanted to say. more of these family conferences, then please don't trouble to ask me to attend, because I shan't. I don't expect now to see a penny of father's money, and please, don't expect to see any of mine. Who wants yours? I'm a wrong man, dear. I will talk like human beings.
You have a good half hour yet, Kay, before you need to step out for the, the London train. I'll take you to the station. What's the matter? Has all this been a bit too much for you? Apparently. I thought I was stuck now. Look how I was doing the modern working woman there. Drinking a cigarette. No good though. See, I've, I've not only been here tonight, I've been here remembering all the other nights when we were here and we weren't like this. Yes, I remember. Those old Christmas and birthday parties. I remember that I saw all of us myself too. Oh, silly girl of 1919. You mustn't mind too much. It's all right, you know. <laughs> Do you like being bored? Oh, no, Alan. It's hideous and unbearable. Remember. Remember what we once were and what we thought we'd be. And now, this. This is all we have, Alan. It's us. Every step we've taken, every tick of the clock, making everything worse. Well, if this is all life is, what's the use? Better to die like Carol than couldn't get found out before time finds you out. Oh, I felt it before, Alan, but never as I felt it tonight. You know, there's a, a great devil in the universe, and we call it time. Did you ever read Blake? Yes. Do you remember this? Joy and woe, a woven fire, a clothing for the soul divine. Under every grief and pine, not a joy with silk and twine. It is right. It should be so. Man was made for joy and woe. And when this we rightly know, Safely through the world we go. Safely through the world we go? No. It's not true, Anne. Or it's not true for me. If things were fixed, good and bad, it would be all right. It's yet worse. We've seen it tonight. Time's beating us. Well, time's only a kind of dream, Kay. <clears throat> if it wasn't, it would have to destroy everything, the entire universe, and then remake it again every tenth of a second. Time doesn't destroy anything. It really moves us on in this life. From one people to the next. The happy young Conways who used to play charades, here they've gone and gone forever. Oh, they're real and existing. Just as we two now are real and existing. We see another bit of the view. A bad bit, if you like, but the whole landscape is still there. Well, we can't be anything other than what we are now. It's hard to explain suddenly like this. There's a book college. Read it on the train. But the point is, now, at this moment, or, or any moment, we're only a cross-section of our real selves. What we really are is a whole stretch of ourselves all our time. And when we come to the end of this life, all our selves, all our time, will be us. The real me, the real me. And then perhaps we'll find ourselves in another kind of time, which is only another kind of dream. I'm trying to understand. If you believe, and if you think it's possible for me to believe, that time isn't just ticking away, wrecking it, and ruining everything. It's all right, Kay. I'll get you that book. You know, I think half our trouble now is we think time is ticking our lives away. Well, that's why we snatch and grab and try to hurt each other. As if you were in a panic on a sinking ship. Yes, just like that. You don't do those things, bless you. I think it's easier not to. It, 
If you take a long view. As if we were immortal beings. Yes. I'm in for a tremendous adventure.
come round and see you sometime. Better ask my mum. Oh, sort of ask my mum, isn't it? Eh? No, I didn't mean it like that at all. I, I know that this is mother's house. Yes. You're old enough to have your old friends, aren't you? Yes, but I, I don't make friends with people very quickly. Oh. I know she did. Did you mean to say you've been discussing me with people? Yes. It was in uniform. I did some stoking. Hard work and a great stunt. It wasn't. You ought to have been ashamed of yourself. Why? Because helping to break a strike and being a blackleg is not a laugh and a stunt. Those rare women were desperately anxious to improve their condition. They did strike for fun. It was a very serious thing for them and for their wives and families. And then people like you, Wally, think it amusing to try and do their work for them and make the strike useless. I think it's shameful the way middle class turn against the working class. Well, there had to be some sort of train service. Why? If the public had to do without trains altogether, then they might realise the railway and do have some grievances. They might. I've no idea they'll be too busy with their own grievance. No trains. <coughs> Another couple of railway straps. And... <coughs> the traffic will be gone forever. Turned into road transport. And where will your clever rail woman be then, eh? And another thing. Working class is out for itself. But well, why shouldn't middle class be out for itself? Because the middle class must have already been out for itself, as you call it. What do you call it? Something in Latin? I say the middle class must have already been successfully out for itself, otherwise it wouldn't be a comfortable mm. middle class. Then why turn against the working class when it is not right to look after itself? Well, that's easy. Then there's only so much to go around, but the more you take, the less I can. I'm sorry, but that's bad economics as well as bad ethics. But we'd have red revolution like Russia if we started listening to these words. Well, I think it's all silly. I can't even agree. Oh, Miss, Miss Hompe. Oh, yes. Good night. I came in here for something. I thought was it. Don't ask me. Were you in the army? Yes. Uh, two years. What crush? I'll be paid though. Oh, that must have been interesting for you. Oh, Mr. Beavers? Oh, you, you look cut out. That's about it. Put out. I mean, you're all hot and angry inside, aren't you? I'm disappointed. Which is it? To make sure, I expect. Well, you must have been Mr. Beavers. You were very nice about Sherrod. And you were very good with me, too. I don't suppose you've ever played before, have you? No. We'll go into that sort of thing in my family. No, I don't think you've had enough fun. That's your problem, Mr. Beavers. You must come and place your arms again. You were all right, you know. Sure, you've got to have to. You were all all right, you know. And don't you forget that, Mr. Beavers. Oh, you were a funny kid. I'm not very funny. I'm certainly not a kid. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll forgive you this time. <laughs> <laughs> I was just leaving, Mrs. Conway. Are you coming? Oh, no, Mr. Thornton and I want to talk business for a few minutes. I'll say. Well, good night, Mrs. Conway. It's been a pleasure to meet you. Good night, Mr. Beaver. Carol, will you again? I'll set you in your heart on the big trail, darling. <laughs> I'm sorry you've got into bread for you to be pushed out. Really, Gerald. The children would never forgive me if I'd encouraged you to stay any longer. No, Fred Beavers hasn't been a success. But after all, he is rather. <laughs> well, I didn't warn you, though. And really, he was so desperately keen to read the famous Conway's. Hazel, you mean? Well, Hazel especially. But really, he wanted to know the whole family. Well, I think they're an attractive lot of children. Only outshone by their attractive mother. Gerald, I don't believe you're going to flirt with me. Well, of course I am. <laughs> By the way, there wasn't any business you wanted to discuss, was there? No, not really. But I think you ought to know I've had another enormous offer for this house. Of course, I would dream of selling it, but it's nice to know it's worth so much. Oh, it's young George Brown wants me to sell him my share of the firm. He said he'd make the best offer that would surprise me. I believe he will be pretty happy too. But there's no point in selling out by the offer of 15%. And once we're out with wartime atmosphere and government restrictions are off, I believe we're in for a tremendous boom. Oh, isn't that lovely? All my children around me and plenty of money.
money to help them to settle down. And you know, Joe, I would get authorized the doctor to do all the way with a business like to sell these things, probably people find so attractive, dear Robert. You know, Joe, it wasn't so very long ago. I thought myself the unluckiest woman in the world. If it hadn't been for the children, I wouldn't have wanted to go on here. Sometimes, but I think, I didn't want to go on here. But now, even though things will never be the same without him, I sometimes think I'm the luckiest woman in the world. All my children around me, quite safe at last, very happy. It wasn't see all over the house. Oh, yes. Yes.
Tilly, you're one of my very best friends, Madge. I hope I'm not flattering myself. No, of course not. Good. So? You're not doing enough, Joe. Well, I am kept pretty busy, you know. Yes, I don't mean that you're lazy. I'm not sure that you want to be. I mean, you're not doing enough with yourself. Oh, Gerald, I would be tremendously proud of you. Well, it's almost overwhelming coming from you, Matt. Why from me? Because I know very well you've got a very good brain. And you're a most critical young woman. Rather frightened. No. You don't mean that. I'd much rather than didn't you? All right, I know it. As a matter of fact, I'm very fond of you, Matt. I don't often get the chance to show you that I am. I've always been fond of you, Gerald. And that's why I say I could be tremendously proud of you. We're going to build a new world now. This horrible war was probably necessary because it was a great bonfire in which to throw all the old nasty rubbish in the world. Civilization could really begin at last. People have learned their lessons. I hope so. Oh, Gerald. Don't be so pessimistic. So cynical. I'm sorry, but a lawyer, even a young one, he sees a lot of human nature in office. There's a procession of people out there with their grievances and quarrels. Sometimes I wonder how much people are capable of learning. That's because you have to deal with the stupid <sighs> But these people all over the world have learned their lessons. You see, there'll be no more piling up of armaments, no more wars, <clears throat> no more hate and intolerance and Violence? Oh, Gerald, I believe that when we look back in 20 years' time, we'll be scandalous that progress has been made, because things happen quickly now. Well, that's true enough. And so is all the rest. Under the league, we'll build a new commonwealth of all the nations living at peace forever. Imperialism will go, and so too, in the end, of course, will capitalism. We know more booms and slumps and strikes Lockout, because the people themselves, led by the very best brains in their country, they'll possess both the political and economic power. to be socialism at last. A happy, free, and prosperous people, all sharing equal opportunities, living at peace forever with the whole world. Bring me my bow of burning gold. Bring me my arrows of desire. Bring me my spear. Oh, clouds unfold. Bring me my chariot of fire. I will not cease from mental fight. Nor shall my sword sleep in my hand. Till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. Perhaps I hardly recognize you, your... Oh, this is the real me. Oh, Gerald, in this new world we're building, men and women won't play a silly game of cross purposes anymore. They'll go forward together, sharing everything. Oh, Gerald, it must be a dear. Your hair is all over the place. You make your nose quite shiny. You're horribly untidy. And I'm sure you're in the middle of a socialist speech that must be boring, poor Gerald. How could I? By going to 
upstairs. Oh, go up, dear. He tell you we're all in here with the key. I know I'm here very nicely, dear. Especially for me to come down. But she doesn't. Now, it is just like old times, isn't it? And we didn't wait it so long. I ought to put you to bed tonight. Oh, no, yes, Mum. Please, please don't. Hey, okay, really? Sorry, Mother. It's just, uh, I can't stand the idea of your messing about those cards tonight. I never really did like you much. I believe only the bad things come true. Certainly not. I claim to your Majesty's girls and scholarship, you remember? I said she was going to get one, didn't I? And I said Robin and Alan would come back safely. I saw an empty car in the car. <coughs> I think I ought to go now, Mrs. Conway. Thank you so much, Kay. <laughs> oh, it's been the loveliest party there ever was. I really have had a marvellous time this day. Well, Mother. Are you two children? Yes. Well, of course we are. Joe? Yes. No. I can't do that, Mary. But then she'd become headmistress of a big school. 
there will be something I can tell you. One thing, I'll try to be wise. I, I promise. 